You are a spark. A single flame. Burning through the day to day. Safely shelter your flame away. And it's just a case of waiting until it goes. Out. But when you share that spark, something heavenly happens. Fires start. Lighting up new pages, tearing through the eras and ages. As the fire that was once your simple solo spark rages. The glow of purpose spreading. This is legacy. This is God's kingdom coming, quicker and multiplying as we share the heat. Melting icy prison walls in cold, warring souls. From spark to flame to fire to furnace. The phosphorus of our calling causing the fruit of heaven to flourish and thrive. Lighting up hallways, homes and houses, terraces and neighbourhoods, communities, schools, streets and cities, reaching governments and committees, from prisons to palaces. Could, Could it be? be? God's love blazing through every boundary and border, his beautiful global New World Order. But it starts with a spark. Welcome to Freedom Church. We are so glad you chose to join us from all over the world. We are a global family of churches gathering in homes, venues, and online. We are passionate about seeing anyone, anywhere. Come to know life-changing relationship with Jesus. In a moment, our event will start. We will hear from around the world. Worship together. And hear a life-changing message of truth and hope. Let's do church! Hey, welcome to Phil. Wherever you're joining from, whether at home or one of our groups in East Africa, you're welcome. Yeah, and if it's your first time joining us, you are a VIP and we are so pleased to have you. If you have any question or you want to know, know more about us, please yeah. feel free to reach us, contact us on our social media, through our Facebook, email, or ask anyone near you who is part of our Freedom Church. Well, I have a question. Who is ready for Phil? I am! Hey. Hey, we are going to kick off with one worship song. So get up on your feet, stand up where you are. Let's see that wildfire passion burn in you as we sing together. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me. Held back the waters for my release Oh, Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah, hallelujah And you have torn apart the sea Sing, clap. 
It was great starting with that worship song and yeah we are still in our DNA series and if it's your first time joining us our DNAs are the 12 principles which define us as a church as Freedom Church yeah and guys we have some exciting news coming after this if you're in the ages of 18 to 25 please don't miss out on this let us hand over to Caleb as he explains more about the tribe our next tribe gathering Hey guys, my name is Caleb and I want to invite all of young adults from all of our campuses on another Global Tribe Gathering. Global Tribe Gathering is a time when we as young adults come together through a video call to get to know each other, inspire each other, to push each other to a more passionate life with God. Our last gathering happened in September when we launched our ministry and we launched our podcast, but this time we prepared even more. We invited Jordan Snowzel from Kigali to share his story, how he grew passion in his life and how he put God's kingdom as a priority in his life and how this thing completely changed everything what he is doing right now. He's leading our East African campuses and if you know Jordan, you know that he's just amazing. So you can't miss this thing. Our gathering will happen on 10th of November. It's Tuesday at 5 p.m. UK time. Make sure that you'll be there. If you can't make it because you work or you maybe 
maybe go to university, it's fine, we'll share the video with you later. But how amazing it would be to meet each other on a live call, it would be great. So, all of the information we'll share on our Instagram, on the tribe.global, make sure you are following us. And that's it from me, thank you very much, young adults, see you on the Tribe Global Gathering. Come on, Caleb. Hey, if you're in that age bracket, 18 to 25, I'm in there. Esther, are you? I wish, but I'm a mose. I'm one of the judges. I'll be here cheering on you guys with Winnie. <laughs> Sorry for you, Esther. Hey, if you're in that age bracket, 18 to 25, this is for you. So be sure to check it out. Yeah, and guys, us as Freedom Church, we love celebrating and honoring people. And as East Africa, we've been honoring people who have lived out these DNAs. And last week, we talked about relevant our time as one of our DNAs. And today, we wanted to celebrate a special couple, Edith and Derek Wire, for being relevant our time. You guys, you, you're really living it. We are so celebrating you and we are so honored to do life with you guys. Talking about punching above our weight, we want to honor Jackie all the way in Kigali. Hey, you are so awesome. Um, and we just are uh, moved by how God has moved in your life, battling cancer, setting up your business. Those are giants that you have conquered. So Jackie, all the way to you, we honor you. Now we are going to hand over to James from our Hariford campus and listen to his story. <laughs> We've been part of Freedom Church for, for many years. I grew up in a Christian family. My, my parents are great role models of Christian parenting. Um, they, they taught me from a young age the importance of, of tithing. They, they taught me how important it was to give God his first fruits. Um, and that's something that stuck with me as I grew up. It's something that I knew was important. There was a principle that God taught about in his word. But when it comes to the context of the day-to-day, -day, when you've got bills to pay, you've got rent coming up, and you, you, you have a limited income, it's, it's a challenge for the best of us. Um, but this year it has been particularly interesting for, for us. Um, obviously, it's, it's been a year of, of conflict for everybody with the whole coronavirus pandemic. And for, for me, I was impacted primarily through, through my job situation. I was made redundant in, in the middle part of this year. The way that things panned out, it just meant that ultimately tithing was left to the last. Um, it just made sense with bills going out, finances. Uh, we had a bit of income at the end of the month. And, and in my mind, it just made sense to use that to, to tithe. And I just had what I thought was control over our finances. The reality was that it came to the end of the month and best laid plans, we ended up running short on money. My, my tithe went from less than 10% to kind of, I'd be lucky if it was five or six. And the first couple of months this happened, it's like, it just didn't sit right with me in my spirit. And then, um, the next month came along and I was like, do you know what? I've had enough of this. Um, we can't keep scrimping on God. It's not, it's not the best way. I know that it's not. It's not the way that I want my kids to learn. It's not the way that I want to have faith. It's that like I believe that I can trust God in this. So at the beginning of the month, I gave my 10% first. It felt a bit risky. It's not my natural thing to do. It's like, I don't like taking risks like that. But miraculously, it came to the end of the month. We paid our bills and yet there was still money remaining. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out on paper. But I thank Jesus that he did come through in that situation. Yeah, but the reality is that when I let go of that and I said, God, I'm gonna trust you something changed inside. Our circumstances didn't change. I was still, un I was still unemployed at the time, trying to set myself up self-employed. Um, my wife was still at university. We still had two kids in, in childcare and school. And like I knew that we had to rely on Jesus. But it is a process of constantly turning back to Jesus, saying, God, I trust you. 
God, I trust you. And it says in his word that he will never leave us or forsake us. And we've got to hold him to that. And believe me, in your situation today, God can come and make an impact. Wow, thanks James for sharing that story. And guys, isn't it amazing to see how God has come through for people? And yeah, I know things have been hard with the pandemic, especially most of us have lost jobs. Others have been laid off from work. And sometimes you're not certain of where to get your next meal. And I, I know that stuff is real. And I know that, yeah, it's happening for other people. But guys, as a church, we are called to God give our first and our best. And it doesn't matter how things are, but I know there is always that thing that we can always put first. Because for my case, if I'm like, I will first sort all my other needs, then I will go to what re remains. That might never happen. But if I choose to be like, you know what, this is how much I get and I'm getting my first to God, then the rest will cover what I need to, to cover. And guys, one of our other DNA is everything is a gift. Even that little thing that you're getting, it's a gift from God. So let us not withhold back. I know some of us may be wondering, so where do I take my tithe? I mean, we no longer meet physically in churches, so do I tithe online? Do I, I don't know, do mobile money? What do I do? If that's you, please reach out to your small group leader. Ask or even text us on, on, on social media, on Facebook. We will direct you on how you can keep tithing and giving. Guys, let us not stop giving. Let us not stop tithing because of the pandemic, because of whatever is happening, because that's a good thing to do. That's an honorable thing to do, to actually honor God with what we have, what he has given us, even in the difficult situations. Wow, that is so good. Hey, we are going to hand over back to worship. We're going to have two worship songs. And uh, after then, after worship, we will have the preach. Uh, we'll have two more of our DNAs. Um, we will elevate from Josh and uh, everything is a gift from Pastor Ed. So let's engage and let's all give it all in. So we'll let's hand over to worship. falls it won't breathe in cause the God I serve knows only how to try oh my God will never fail yeah my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord.
excited we're here in Freedom Rally recording this message for you and we want to share this DNA we will elevate so church this is all about honor this is all about this principle of honoring one another and in Romans 12 verse 9 it says honor one another above yourselves there's this teaching there's this instruction that we get from scripture which is about honoring one another it's a biblical principle but this ancient word that we hardly use in our day-to-day lives what does it really mean i can tell you as we look into our world right now we see in politics this backbiting arguing we can see disrespect name calling we can look into even what's been going on with uh, this, on social media with cancel culture. Yeah. Is that a culture of honour? It's just the right. opposite. Yeah. And we see where people want to cancel one another out, their voice, their identity, wow. because they have a differing point of view. Yeah. There's something powerful in this world about dishonour. Yeah. Even as we look at what's been going on this year with racism, with prejudice, yeah. with discrimination, not just dishonouring one person, but dishonouring a whole people group. Different people groups being dishonoured totally. 
Our world has a real problem with what honour means. And in fact, it's intent on dishonouring. And it's interesting because the, the world can want to borrow a lot of Christian language about kindness and goodness. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, honour is lacking. Yeah. Honour is missing. And Freedom Church, we are called to honour. Yeah. We're called to come and honour. But what does honour mean? Yeah. Honour means to highly esteem. It means to really value. That's what it means. It means to hold in high regard. And so we want to be those in our church that hold one another in high regard, that choose to esteem, that choose to value others. And that is unusual in this world. But this is who we are as a church. We're not just going to assume it. We're not just going to take it for granted. We're going to be intentional about honour. That's why we put it in our DNA. Because there's something about all of us in our humanity, we have a disposition. It means our automatic posture. And for a lot of us, our automatic posture as humanity, it's not to honour. It's not natural to us. And that's why we've written this into the culture of who we are as a church. Because we're saying if we want to be an honouring people, then we've got to be intentional about it. We've got to think about it. We've got to be mindful of it because that's the only way that honour happens. It's when we're mindful of it. And so most people don't have this disposition. I've, I've been a pastor and a leader in church for a number of years now. And I can tell you from having done a lot of leading, a lot of pastoring, it's not an automatic posture to people to honour. Most of us want to have our honour earned in some way. But this DNA talks about we will freely give honour because we are not going to wait for someone to jump through hoops before we start valuing who they are. We're going to be different from the world. That means that you don't have to do anything to try and get the honour from us in Freedom Church. We're going to honour you just because of who you are. And that's it. Just because of your identity as a son or a daughter of God. That is who we are as a church, but it doesn't come naturally, guys. And we have got to start being intentional about this. I just, as an example of how maybe this isn't such a natural thing, for even our church that preaches and teaches some of these principles, I asked our senior pastor, how many messages do you get when you preach a message that goes out to over a thousand people all around the world? How many messages do you get on a regular basis? There wasn't many. Sometimes we get messages from some of our pastors who want to feedback and encourage the message. But I said, okay, well, what about when you get a letter written in from, you know, one of the people, the hundreds and even thousand people around the world just maybe taking that message impacted me. That moment impacted me. I just want to take 10, 15 minutes to write out how that message impacted. Maybe once this year, maybe twice. Sometimes we can't even take 30 seconds to honour the word that's come with a post on social media and we're quickly on to the next thing. Something that's taken someone, one of our leaders, maybe hours to pray into, hours to prepare, to process, to wrestle through and we end up listening to it maybe 30, 40 minutes and then we're on to the next thing. But guys, I believe that in this church, we're going to have a culture. We're going to be a people that honours the word. We're going to be a people that honours one another. And we even went to this next level in our DNA where we specifically wrote in the honouring of leaders. So he said, we're going to honour all people, but also we're going to honour leaders. And that might, that might prickle and barb a few people. But what we noticed is that we wanted to just assume that our church would grasp hold of this in the past. But we need to start being specific with where honour really needs to be focused. Because it's biblical. If we look in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 12 to 13, it says this. And now friends, we ask you to honour those leaders who work so hard for you. It's right here in scripture. Honour those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. And then it says this, overwhelm them with appreciation and love. 
I can tell you right now, there's not any leaders in our movement and probably any other that are suffering from overappreciation. Okay? There is thankfulness to be expressed. There is honour to be expressed. And I want to encourage our church around the world to start being thoughtful. Thoughtful people about how we honour. Because it's kind of like romance, okay? Now, if you are automatically Romeo, if it just flows out of you, that's, that's, that's an unusual man, okay? The, what I find is that most men that want to be romantic have to go and book the flowers, they have to go and buy the chocolates, they have to go and plan the date night because it didn't just happen by default. Yeah. You had to get intentional about your romance. And it's the same with honour in the church. If you want to honour the bride of Christ, if you want to honour one another, if you want to honour leaders, if you want to honour the people that come through our doors every week, you've got to actually think about it. Because at the disposition of our flesh, our automatic nature will always be to think of self and to get into a flow and into a motion and a habit of how we treat people. But if we want to, and that's the same with marriage, right? And romance, we can get into the motion. But when we get intentional, it shows how we value. And it's the same with honour. We need to honour, we need to think, we need to be thoughtful about this. And I think there's just this amazing example that we get in scripture from this story of this sinful woman in Luke 7. So we're going to look in scripture now at this woman that came and made this scene and something extraordinary happened. In verse 36, it says this, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. So Jesus is invited to this man's house for dinner. He sits back at the table and the woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. And then in verses 44, it says, Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? So Jesus has this conversation with Simon, who is the Pharisee that, uh, of, the, of the man's house that he's in. So he's the Pharisee that... Um, that he's eating at the table and he said do you see this woman I came into your house but you did not give me any water for my feet but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair you did not give me a kiss but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet you did not put oil on my head but she has poured perfume on my feet and we see this great contrast in scripture of both receiving Jesus, but one honours him. I mean, Simon had him into his home. He was cooking him dinner. But our thoughts matter. What we think towards someone matters. That's how we honour, with our thoughts. With the way that we have a posture towards someone. The way that we see someone. What we speak out, that's how we honour. What we action, that's how we honour. And each one of us has opportunities all the time to honour. And we can choose to honour and value or we can choose to miss that opportunity. But it's all about those choices that we make. And I just see the stark contrast here of the woman coming in. And guys, she's making a scene. It's awkward. She's coming up to Jesus while he's sat at the table crying, making that kind of weepy, cryy noise. And then all the the men, they're sneering at her because they see her as a sinful woman. What are they doing? You know, um, rubbing the teacher's feet, kissing the teacher's feet with her hair. It's like this, this is just, it's awkward. It's weird. Honouring will cost you something. Honouring will cost you something of your reputation. Maybe people will say something about you, about the way that, you know, you try to behave around this leader because you chose to honour. Wow. About the way that you chose to be around this person. That's so good. But it's about seeing that actually there's far more important things than what others say about us. Wow. It's about what God has called us to do. Yeah. Maybe people will sneer at you. Will you let that snuff out 
the flame of honour in your life? Or will you choose to value? Will you choose to honour? Even maybe when it's awkward, you push through because you want to value someone. You want to value them and honour them for the way that they should be valued and honoured. I think of um, the other great example that we have of honour is because Jesus taught us that's how we should honour one another. And we can find this in John 13. So if you want to turn with me to John 13. And this is the Last Supper. It's the night before Jesus is about to go to the cross And he wants to leave the disciples with something that's going to last in their minds forever. He wants to show something that's going to represent his whole ministry through one example. Okay, And so this is what happens in John 13 verse 4. He washes the disciples' feet. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, He poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realise now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. This is too awkward, Jesus. I can't take this. This is not acceptable behaviour. You're the Messiah. You're the greatly esteemed one. How could you treat me that way? Verse 8. So no, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. He's like, okay, if that's the deal, you can take the whole thing. Let's just go. You can watch the whole thing because I want every part of who you are, Jesus. And then in verse 15, it says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we see Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, honouring his disciples. Taking a serve. Okay, he was there at the beginning of creation. He's made everything that we can see. And yet he's on his knees cleaning these dirty, stinky feet. And guys, they're not in socks and shoes. These guys are in sandals. They've been walking. They've been traveling. The scent was probably not something you want to be around. Okay? Pungent is the word that comes to mind. And yet Jesus is choosing to honor Peter and the disciples. And I thought it would be great if we could recreate this moment. So I'm going to just wash um, someone's feet here today. So Dan, I wonder if you could come up. And um, speaking of pungent. Okay, mate. So I think that there's something about washing feet that's so symbolic in Scripture that as we find this, this truth of Jesus, the King of Kings, honouring the disciples. How much more, if the King of Kings is doing that, should we be doing that for one another? But I think there's something that happens to us, okay, of what what holds us back from giving honour. I think as I've talked about tonight, that one of the reasons is that we are sometimes, we're not intentional about honour. We don't think about being Uh, honouring to one another in the way that we should. But I think one of the other reasons that we don't honour is because we think somehow it's going to puff up the individual. If I value and honour you, then it's going to build you up in some way. But I can tell you that the reason that Peter didn't want to be honoured in that way is because it humbled him. The King of Kings is honouring me. I'm, I'm... receiving something and as you um as you receive honor there is something so humbling about it actually does the opposite from puffing you up it actually humbles you so honor is actually it does the complete different thing that we might suppose which is when we come and we honor one another it humbles us my posture i'm on my knees but it also it humbles you right Because as we receive honour, then it 
gives us that humility. Yeah. And what does God do with those that humble themselves? Right. He lifts them up. Yeah. Church, we're going to elevate because we're going to be humble. And we're going to get on our knees and honor one another. Thanks, Dan. So, guys, we're going to build a culture of honor. Amen. We're going to build a culture of honor in this yeah. house. And we use the language in this DNA about building culture because it's like building blocks that go on top of one another. You don't just click your fingers and it's there overnight. Yeah. It's something we have to be intentional about. Oh, yeah. It's something that we're going to have to work on. It's something we're going to have to go and do and build block after block. But as we build a culture of honour, the reason we do that is because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. So there's something so powerful about your innate value for every single person that we come into touch with. Okay, And think about it like this. If you just, uh, you've got the Mona Lisa painting, okay, and you put her in the kitchen, you've just got, you've inherited her or something from your great, great auntie, and you've just got the most amazing painting in the world, and it's in your kitchen, it's in direct sunlight, you're cooking, uh, and some oil splashes onto it, and it would just be, it would just be shocking. Maybe you've got the brand new iPhone 12, and... You're, you know, you're one of those people maybe that, that likes to keep the plastic on for a while. You know, like the little, oh, the case doesn't come yet, so I'm just going to keep the little sheath, the cover, on the top. And you just rip it off and you shove it in your pocket with the coins and the keys the first day. I know some of us are cringing right now, just the thought of the keys scratching into the new glass. But when we treat each other with dishonour, it's like so much worse than we could possibly imagine on those things. It's like taking what's been so fearfully and wonderfully made and treating it in a way that doesn't give God honour. Because there's something so powerful about if we're made in the image of God, that each son, each daughter, that you're made in the likeness of God, when I honour you, I honour God. Think about our world. Think about the marriages that could be restored. Think about the relationships that could get healing. Think about the wars that could be avoided if we honoured one another. It's amazing to think about how honour could change the world because there is so much suffering in the world because of dishonour. Honour is the chance to bring resolution, to bring heaven to earth, to bring healing. And we can do that, church. We can be that answer. So church, we will elevate. There's something so powerful as we go out here with this purpose of knowing that we're going to bring honour into this world. Because if we can know that entitlement will always take, but honour will always give, it will set our posture as we go into the church and we go into the world. So be blessed church. Thank you for joining us. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for God's provision and that even in these times we've got things to look forward to. I am grateful for an amazing bunch of friends that I have. I'm grateful for all our family in Brilliant Church because we have each other and pray for each other during the crisis. Um, I am very grateful for actually having the lockdown time to reconnect with my family. I'm grateful for Tony and Esther for godly friendship. So this year, since we're accepting Jesus back into my life a few months ago, I've been like super grateful and overwhelmed by um, his like grace and love. I'm grateful for coming to Freedom Church for the first time and making the decision to call it my home. I am so grateful for my church family and friends uh, who have been so supportive during this season and for helping me intensify my relationship with God. I'm grateful for finding family and community in Freedom Church. For the past seven years, I've been suffering from a blood disorder. I'm grateful that God has healed me in this season. Hi, I'm Precious. I'm grateful for sustainability. I'm grateful for Precious! <laughs> I think we all know that I'm grateful for moustache. Yeah. Marriage! Because we become one. Yay! We are so blessed to be one in spirit now because God has totally redeemed us. He's made us new. And so we're, we just get excited every single day for marriage because it's such a blessing. For everything's a 
begin, let's see what it says. We intentionally celebrate and give thanks. We shake off complacency and entitlement to overflow with gratitude for God, our lives and one another. Practicing thankfulness gives us joy that will sustain us. Isn't that fantastic? I just love that. So like I said, life itself is a gift. It's an absolute gift uh, to be on this planet, isn't it? It's amazing. And if you see life like that, it really helps a lot if, it, if you see it, that it is a gift. Um, but gratitude is huge. It is huge to God. It's so important to God, so it should be important to us as well. And, um, you know, God gave us this earth. And if you go back to the beginning, he gave us this earth to live on. He created the universe. And what a beauty. Isn't it fantastic? Not living in some horrible, mundane place. We live in the most beautiful world. And it is absolutely fantastic. And God made it for us to dwell on. He made it for us to rule. He made it for us so it would be beautiful. And he paints a new landscape for us every day. And so creation is just one thing to be thankful for that God has made us. And if you go back to the very beginning, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, weren't they? And it was absolutely perfect. They had everything. They had the flowers, they had the trees, there were no bugs at that point. Um, they had the most beautiful bodies, but we won't go there. And, um, and they had organic vegetables and fruit. They had the best of everything. The climate was perfect, but most of all, they had a relationship with God. And uh, so everything was perfect, but it's amazing, isn't it, that everything was perfect, and yet there was one thing that, um, you know, instead of being so grateful for everything that they had in the garden, Eve became fixated and focused on the one thing she couldn't have. And when that happens and we become um, entitled and we focus on the one thing we can't have, instead of everything else we already have that we should be thankful for, we get ourselves into trouble. And so then, obviously, sin came into the world because she couldn't resist that temptation any longer. And, um, and she took that forbidden fruit because she wanted to know more and she felt entitled to know more and it got us all into big trouble. And so that's when everything went pear-shaped, including Eve. Um, so, so let's learn to be grateful. I mean, that's... <laughs> but you know, um, God had a rescue plan, didn't he? Thankfully, he had a rescue plan, and he, I mean, his rescue plan, it couldn't have been more amazing. I mean, the best gift you could ever think of or imagine, he gave us Jesus. He gave us Jesus, the most amazing gift, to come and dwell with us, and then to die on a tree for us, to forgive us for messing up in the first place, and then to actually so that we could have a relationship with God again. And you know, along with that gift comes salvation, it comes freedom, there comes um, forgiveness, there comes so many great things that he gives us that we need to be grateful for. And um, you know, healing, salvation, we can outgive God, can we? And when I think about it, I think everything good in my life is because of God. Everything good that I have in my life, my family, my friends, my church, my husband, everything great in my life is because of him. So gratitude comes out of that overflow, doesn't it? It comes out of that overflow of praise and thanksgiving. You know, it says in Psalm 100, to enter his courts, like we have today, to enter his presence with thanksgiving. Not to wait till you get there, but to come with thanksgiving. We should have it in our hearts already. Come and, and, and give him that thanksgiving that he deserves. Enter with the password, thank you. That is our password for God's presence, is thank you. So enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talk in praise, thank him and worship him. So gratitude is a daily choice, isn't it, for all of us? It's a daily choice. We can choose to wake up in the morning grumpy and, um, you know, like be miserable and moaning and complaining, or we can wake up and straight away we can be grateful. And do you know what, it changes our day? Because we are atmosphere setters, and if we have gratitude in our hearts, it affects us, but it also affects everybody around us. And uh, it's so important that we have that attitude of gratitude, isn't it?
but you know, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? Even in this season of COVID, we have so much to be grateful for. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed that people seem to be more grateful for little things than they ever have been before. And uh, you know, who would have ever thought we'd be so excited about toilet roll? I mean, here in the UK, we had a shortage of loo roll. You couldn't get it anywhere. It was like nothing on the shelves at all in the shop. I don't know if it was the same in your location, but toilet roll, loo roll, became such a blessing. And um, here's a picture of me on Mother's Day. Sol bought me a lovely packet of toilet roll, and do you know what? I was so thankful. I couldn't have been happier, and there's me hugging my toilet roll. So I thought, well, I can't really come um, to talk about everything as a gift without bringing a gift. So if anyone's in need of a toilet roll today, is there anyone in need? I have a very nicely wrapped toilet roll. Anyone need a toilet roll? Yes, Alex, come on, you can have it. Take it with you to Germany, enjoy it. See, the rest of you are a bit slow there. There was 50 pound in the, in the middle of that toilet roll. Well, minus the, minus the nor on the end. Um, but you know, go and treat yourself to a nice coffee. So, let's be grateful for the small things. But even in this season, you know, um, we're so grateful for our hairdressers, aren't we? I mean, when I saw my hairdresser, I wanted to bow down before her. I was like, couldn't hug her, but I could bow down. Um, <laughs> And our teachers having to homeschool. I mean, thankfully, mine were too old, so I didn't have to do that. I did think about homeschooling one time, and it stayed as a thought, and uh, that was it. But you homeschoolers, well done. We celebrate you because you have done the most awesome job. And do you know what? People that have really inspired me through this season have been our single mums. Absolutely incredible. So give it up for our, our mums. Absolutely amazing. Let's tell them after. But you know, it's strange, isn't it? Because often when there's something you can't have, you're more grateful for it than when you actually had it. And it's a bit like that with our health, isn't it? How often do you wake up and say to God, thank you so much for my health today? And yet when we don't have it, it's the first thing that we pray about, isn't it? But I've loved, even in this season, the celebration culture that our nation and our world really has had through COVID of going out and celebrating our key workers, going out and celebrating the healthcare in your region. And it's been amazing. I know perhaps that hasn't happened on a global scale, but here in the UK, we would go out with our pots and pans every week. We would go and cheer them on because we were cheering them on. They're on the front line. And it was such a great celebration. Uh, and, you know, we created that and, it, and we set a culture and it's amazing and I love that because gratitude it has a voice doesn't it yeah. you know gratitude has a voice and it also can have an action as well and um, you know what's the point in thinking do you know what that person aren't they just amazing I mean that Saz and Dave that couple they're just incredible and uh, you know we could be thinking this and thinking Dave he can do just about anything. He can sing, he can dance. I mean, they can both preach their hearts out. They're an amazing couple. And you just think it, but you never tell them. What is the point of that? It's like, put a voice to it. And if you think that, then go and tell them because that is gonna encourage them. We need to say to each other and encourage each other and celebrate each other. You know, there's so many ways we can be grateful for one another. You can send a note. You don't even have to buy a card. You can, um, show kindness to someone to say thank you. You can be generous, you can give time to someone. That is the most precious thing we can have, is our time, you can give that time to someone, or you can serve someone, can't you? There's so many ways that we can be grateful for one another. I mean, I'm always telling G how much I love him, because I do, but I also tell him how grateful I am for him. And I don't just say, thank you, I'm grateful. I, I tell him why I'm grateful and I elaborate because our gratitude should have layers, a bit like the wrapping paper, you can put layers to it. And I think we're great in Freedom Church at being grateful, but I think we can add some layers to it and make it better as well. Um, so yeah, I'm always telling him how great he is, because he is, he's amazing. But try it on your date night. This week, those of you, try it on your date night, sit down and tell each other 10 things that you're grateful for and um, see where it leads. I'm recommending it. <laughs> so, I remember the very first time I heard uh, the story about the 10 lepers. 
And I remember it being absolutely shocking uh, because the story of the 10 lepers, I mean, most of you will know it, but they were crying out to Jesus. They cried out to him and called him and said, heal us, help us. And Jesus, of course, he turned around and he healed them. And let's take the story from there. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. And then Jesus said, were there not 10 healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God? How shocking is that? And it just shows, doesn't it, that it's not always as natural as you think to be grateful. Um, And I just wanted to mention that because sometimes we can pray for so many things, can't we? We're always praying and asking God for things. How many times do we actually come back and say, thank you so much for answering my prayer? And it's so true, we need to practice that. Did you know that... Gratitude has health benefits. Who doesn't want health benefits? Amazing. See, God knows what's best for us. He knows what's good for us, doesn't he? Gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, and improve their health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. I mean, that's amazing in itself, isn't it? So gratitude comes with benefits. I was talking to someone recently that got herself into such a low place because of circumstances, because of what she was going through, because of COVID, and she became very negative, and uh, it ended up that she got quite depressed. And so she went to see a counsellor, and the first thing the counsellor said was, go away this week, I want you to say um, every day 10 things that you're grateful for and I want you to either speak it out or write it down. And so she did, and she said, I felt so much better after doing it. And I was like, you know, that's what we do as Christians. I didn't say that, but you know, that's what we do. But I said, we pr- that's what we, we do do that, but we praise Jesus and we say thank you to him. We don't just say thank you to the fresh air. We actually aim it and thank God for it. The opposite is if you are ungrateful, then you become entitled, you become angry, you can become bitter and depressed. And you know, and we don't even wanna be around people that are are like that sometimes, do we? Because it's so draining. And yet, and it always leads us into a bad place. So to be ungrateful leads us into an unhealthy place. And if you think, you know, just an example of that is Moses in Egypt. uh, he saved the um, Israelites, and he took them out of Egypt, set the captives free, and it wasn't very long, was it? They'd seen a miracle. They'd seen the, the sea open. God did amazing miracles. They saw provision from God, and yet it was so strange because it wasn't long before they started moaning and grumbling and complaining and criticizing, and, um, you know, they, they criticized their freedom even. They were like, you know, they'd been rescued from thousands of years of slavery, and yet they were like, oh, we were better off when we were in Egypt. They criticized the miracle food. They criticized their leader. They criticized God. And they even made a false God and started worshiping that God. And it ended in a bad result. They never saw the promised land. So it just shows how much trouble we can get ourselves in when we don't show gratitude. But it's not always easy, is it? Um, but it is a choice, and it is a practice. It's something we have to practice so that it becomes a lifestyle. And, uh, you know, that attitude of gratitude. And I have to say, even from experience, it's such a game changer to be grateful because, you know, in the early stages of building church, I, I realized that I had got to a stage where I started becoming um, ungrateful and I started moaning and complaining. I was like, this is so hard. Somebody else has left. People keep criticizing us. People misunderstand us. You know, I feel like giving up. And that's what kind of place it gets you into. And then somebody came and they spoke a word into our church. It was all around gratitude. And it became such a lifeline to me. It was a word of rescue. And then I started putting it into practice. And it it was a 
an absolute game changer. It kept us going and, and it sustained us through that time. And you know, whenever we felt discouraged, we'd always say to each other, you know, the king, he's still on his throne. And we would drink, have, raise our glass and say to the king of kings. And um, you know, regardless of your circumstances, choose gratitude. Choose joy because it is a choice. And, you know, joy is a weapon as well. And joy brings laughter, and laughter is medicine to our soul. And even, you know, when we went through some of the worst things, like Jordan is, um, you know, when he was facing brain surgery, it was devastating, and yet there was still so much to thank God for. We thank God for the NHS. We thank God for the nurses and the doctors. We thank God that they found the dermoid. We thank God that the world was praying for him alongside us, and there was so much to be grateful for. And I remember being in the mosh pit with Jordan and, and all his brothers and Gary as well, and we were jumping up and down, praying praising God. And uh, did I feel like praising God? I actually didn't. I really didn't. I felt like curling up in the corner and crying. But it was a choice. And God is asking you to choose to praise Him today, whatever your circumstances, because it's a key and it makes a huge difference. You know, Apostle Paul, he's amazing, isn't he? He went through so many different um, things, and, you know, he would always say to, he taught us not to worry about things. And, uh, you know, he was grateful whether he had small or whether he had a lot, whether he was in jail, whether he was shipwrecked or beaten. He found contentment, didn't he, with whatever, but it came through choosing gratitude and choosing joy. And he says in Philippians 4 4, I love this. Celebrate God all day, every day. All day, every day. I mean revel in Him. Revel in God. I love that line, revel in Him. But it all starts here, doesn't it? But it starts in the home of our hearts, but it starts in our homes as well. You know, we need to set a culture of gratitude and, um, and celebration in our homes. You know, learn to celebrate in your homes the little things. Because we don't want to leave our home and, and go to a different culture in church. No, it should be the same culture. You know, our DNA, our new DNA is amazing, but we should have it in our homes, in our lives, in our lifestyles. And then when we go to church, it's no different, um, but we celebrate together. I mean, I don't know about you, but I was brought up to say thank you, please thank you. My mum would say, you've been to tea somewhere, did you say thank you before you left? I was like, yes, mum. And even when I was married with five kids, she would say, did you say thank you to that person? I'm like, mum, I'm a grown up now. I have five kids of my own and I know to say thank you. And it's something we can teach our kids, but it's so much more than manners, isn't it? And you know, I mean, I've got to say, I even say thank you. If I ask my Google Hub for something, like, can you get me a recipe up or some music on? I always say, please and thank you. And like the boys, they laugh at me. But when she doesn't cooperate, I'm like, well, you didn't say thank you, did you? So, you know, it does work, people. I'm telling you, it works. So let's teach our kids. We're raising the next, aren't we? Let's teach them to be grateful and appreciate the little things as well as the big things. That's just the basics, isn't it? But let us not be those Christians that when someone is sharing a tragedy or, or they've just been through something horrendous, they've lost someone that they love or they've, I don't know, been through a tragedy or they, their marriage is broken down. Don't be that Christian that is like, well, everything's a gift, isn't it? Don't do that. That isn't what this is about because you concentrate on your own gratitude and let God worry about the rest. And I'm just saying that because I know that that can happen sometimes. So just be careful of that. You know, be sensitive when somebody is going through something horrendous. So I'm nearly finished now. So how are you going to show gratitude this week? How are you going to show it? How are you going to voice it? How are you going to demonstrate it this week? We need to be a people that are marked by gratitude, don't we? Let's get on our social media and be thankful this week. Let the world see that we're a grateful people. And I just want to finish with this psalm because I love it. And you can read the whole chapter when you go home. Um, but this is the first verse. Oh, thank God he is so good. His love never runs out. And all of you set free by God, tell the world. 
You know, God has given us the greatest gift ever. So when we go away from this place, this greatest gift is not for us to keep to ourselves, it to share with others and share that love and share that gratitude. Amen. Thank you for listening, church. Wow, what an amazing message. Hey, thanks, Pastor Heather and Josh. And hey, within the course of this week, who is it in your community that you need to elevate? Could it be your leader? Could it be your friend that you need to elevate? And talking about being grateful, hey, it's been a tough year, but where is it that you have to show more gratitude? Where is it in your life that you need to, you know, say thank you for something good that God has done in your life? Yeah, and guys, if it's your first time here or you have questions or you've never taken that step of accepting Jesus as your personal savior and you've been asking yourself, what does salvation mean? Or how do I get plugged into Freedom Church? This is the right place for you. Please send us a text on any of our social media platforms or reach out to your small group leader and ask. We'll be happy to talk to you and guide you and lead you on. Wow, wasn't that amazing? Hey, thank you for joining us. I love Phil. See you next time, same time, same place. Bye! Bye.